Well, everybody, uh, welcome. I'm going to be filling in for uh, Mark Martin for tonight, and I'm going to be the host. And so um, it's 7.30, we welcome everybody. It looked like everybody's coming in from the new members meeting. So it uh, looked like everybody's here, so we've got up to 85. So good evening to everybody. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Margaret. Uh, she's going to come up with the uh, resident report. Hi. Hi. Well, welcome everybody. I'm going to share uh, this month's PowerPoint. So welcome to Rose City Astronomers, July 19th, 2021. So we're gonna do some basics here. Um, you know, this Zoom thing kind of just gets right in the middle of where I wanna put my, my mouse here. Our membership, uh, uh, just some basics, our membership is staying pretty steady. We're at 755 and a year ago we were at 753, down a little bit from two, two years ago, but not at all bad. Our telescope workshop is going to meet on Saturday, July 24th. Again, this is an online meeting and they will send out the link. And um, the Astro Imaging SIG is going to meet Tuesday, August 3rd. Again, uh, uh, a Zoom meeting, and they will send out the link. Downtowners is meeting in person, and usually it's the first Friday, but uh, I set it for the second Friday of August, and I will be sending out uh, uh, an email to the club about that and inviting everybody to come down. A uh, little more about that in a minute. Our next meeting is Monday, August 16th. Okay, it's been a very good month. I've been very, very pleased at the kind of small and tenuous uh, uh, motions we've made to kind of quote, open up to the extent that we can. We had our first Downtowners. Now Downtowners is a once a month lunch that we have at McMinimans on Broadway. And we've been doing that Downtowners totally for probably 25 years. And at uh, McMinimans on Broadway, probably 20 years of that. Um, we had uh, sort of average attendance, but several of the people who came were new. And it was just a lot of fun. We had a very good conversation and uh, they were uh, McMinimans on Broadway was glad to service. They are shorthanded <laughs> like everybody is these days. So we're all still kind of trying to get used to this thing of being out in uh, public again. Um, Jim Todd sent out uh, an announcement looking for volunteers for OMSI events and he got a lot of response and he was very pleased about the support. And he'll probably talk to you more about that. But that's been uh, a good thing that happened this month. And it's been a good month number three, our White River uh, Star Party, White River Snow Park, Snow Park Star Party was really a total success. I was just thrilled with how it went. We had a total of 21 parties, about 23 telescopes, which is pretty average for amateur astronomers. And 14 of our attendees were new members. So it was a lot of fun. I just loved the conversation. It just, it reminded me of being at Oregon Star Party where everybody's, you know, working with each other and teaching each other and learning from each other. It was just a lot of fun. So I have really good feeling about um, all these new members who've joined the club in the last year and a half. So we're kind of in mourning about the fact that Oregon Star Party, OSP, is not going to be held this year. It was uh, in planning and then the Forest Service shut it down because of fire danger. They pulled the permit. So Matt Vartani and then I got real busy. Um, Matt, do you want to uh, turn on your mic and take it from here for a minute? Sure thing. Thank you, Margaret. Uh -huh. Well, I am very excited to announce that we are going to have a dark sky star party at Trout Lake. That will be August 5th, Thursday, August 5th through Sunday, August 8th. 
you can arrive a little early if you like, stay a little late if you like. Um, it's not that far, it's, it's less than two hour drive uh, and there are no gravel roads to drive on. Uh, and there's a ton of daytime activities. There's waterfalls, there's an ice cave, there's, there's a natural bridges, nature trail. You can go pick huckleberries during the day, there's hiking. Um, and we'll have some other activities that will be announced soon. Um, now the downside is it is primitive camping. There's no running water there. There's no electricity. There's no cell service unless you're standing in just the right place. Um, it is a paved lot, a lot uh, just like White River is. Um, we will be having two porta potties delivered plus a hand washing station. Uh, those will be delivered on Thursday by 5 p.m. Uh, there's also a vault toilet there. Um, I was at the site over the weekend and I did, uh, I took a series of horizon measurements from different places in the snow park and I have created some data um, on what the horizons look like and they're not that bad. They're not as bad as I thought they were. You know, the trees have been growing there and, and I know I've been concerned about losing horizons, but um, uh, but they're looking good. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll post all of the data on the horizons. I'll post all of the data uh, or all of the information that I've recited, plus other information to the forum. And I will also send out an email blast with the same information if you don't have access to the forum. So super excited about this uh, and looking forward to it. And that's it. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you. I'm really excited about this. I haven't been to Trout Lake for a long time, and I always like to get a piece of that huckleberry pie at that little cafe there. <laughs> so um, there might be some alternatives. If you don't want to go that far, for example, um, I think that the people who usually go up to Skyview Acres will probably go up there. And uh, it, uh, I think Trout, Trout Lake is smaller than White River, and it's certainly not big enough to handle probably everybody who signed up for Oregon Star Party. So I'm looking for other places that people might want to go on the same weekend to kind of spread us around and take full advantage of everything available to us. Um, if you're a new member and you haven't been to Skyview Acres, uh, the people who go up there are mostly imagers, and if you're interested in that, contact the ASER Imaging SIG and see about getting directions and maybe going up there with somebody. If you can't find anybody, um, uh, send me an email and I'll get you connected up. Mark Lowenthal has developed a site in the town of Morrow. Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Um, sure. Um, yeah, we've got, uh, or I, I've been, um, been up I'm going up there for the last few years and before um, COVID uh, um, I'd you know get on the forum and sometimes some other folks would travel over there with me and it's a three bedroom farmhouse outside of Morrow, Oregon and um, so you get three bedrooms two bathrooms it's like a little um, it's the old farmhouse or it's like a um, well I think it's ranch style yeah, it's a it's an old ranch little little um, um, prefab ranch style for, um, um, house, um, and um, it's it's a it's a nice site. It's it's sheltered from the wind. It can be windy along uh, uh, adjacent to the um, um, the gorge sometimes, uh, but it's in a in a valley that that's oriented north south. So you have a view all the way down to the southern horizon. Um, um, but it's protected on either side from from wind. So, um, so usually down a, you can the, the tops of the trees can be blowing, and then it, down at ground level it can be it'll be much calmer. Um, so um, when it when it's windy, so it's 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 a nice spot. It's very dark, um, and uh, and it's it's good for people that have trouble camping. Um, you know, you can get three parties. Each have, bedroom has a double bed, so. Um, and uh, there, there's uh, there's a nice couch there if somebody wants us uh, an extra person. It's $125 a night, 
Um, and so you just, we just split it up by however many people are, are staying. And so the more people stay, the cheaper it gets. <laughs> so and, I think Mark um, is going to be watching the, the, the smoke charts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, it's I, even worth going there that, that yeah. weekend or not. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the concern is that you go the, the, the southeastern triangle of the state is I, it's likely going to be just flooded with smoke for the last, next two or three months. I mean, I just, the bootleg fire looks like it's just getting worse and worse and okay. I'm nearing now, you know, maybe okay. not contained by November and that doesn't uh, bode well for the September 5th par um, star party. Okay, well, um, if you decide to go, where are you going to post on the forum if you decide to go? Or um, even if you decide clearly not to go? Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, on the uh, forum, there's um, uh, usually impromptu observing, or ah, okay. that would be the section um, um, where I'd where I'd post that sort of thing okay. as to whether I'll be going out there or not. Okay. And um, all right, well, watch for that uh, if Mark's going to work up a party to go out there tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Um, some people may still choose to go back to White River Snow Park. It's closer to Portland uh, and, uh, you know, doesn't have quite the commitment that going to Trout Lake would have. So it's public, it's open to public. Anybody can drive in there anytime. Um, there might be some other options. I know there are people who have favorite campgrounds they like to go to or places, friends, etc. cetera. Uh, but the one thing is don't go up to Indian Trail Springs. That's where Oregon Star Party is held, and Oregon Star Party has made it very, very, very clear that because uh, of the conditions that closed OSP this year, it's not a good idea to go up there and do private camping and thinking, oh, I'll just go up there with my RV anyway. Uh, no, don't do that. Okay, so uh, Mike Reitmeyer is looking for volunteers for two scouting events in August. Mike, do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, so we have two events coming up. They are on Saturday, August 21st and Thursday, August 26th. So I am going to be needing probably at least two to three people besides myself with telescopes for both nights. Uh, we're expecting 70 to 80 guests per night. Uh, so three telescopes should cut it, four would be awesome. The site is about two hours drive from Portland. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, shoot me an email and I will fill you on the details. And Margaret, I believe you are going to uh, send out a page to the former volunteers uh, just to get the ball rolling. Right. Yeah, we've uh, kind of updated the email list for volunteers that we used a couple of years ago. Uh, and Mike has written up a, an appeal. We are going to ask the volunteers, including previous volunteers and new volunteers to sign a code of conduct. Uh, and we also are, uh, are going to be asking our volunteers to be uh, vaccinated. Hey Mike, okay. can you post your email in the chat? Yeah, I can do that. So okay. you can copy and paste it. Yeah. And you know, these PowerPoints go on our website right on the very first page and these leaves, links are live. So tomorrow when this gets posted, you can just go in here and click on this. But it saves you having to learn how to spell Reitmeyer. <laughs> it even took me a few tries to learn that, Margaret. <laughs> OK, um, we have had some kind of complaints or feedback anyway, st uh, information coming back from Stubb that things have kind of gotten a little bit deteriorated up there. Uh, so uh, at this point, I think uh, it would be a good idea, especially if you've never been up there before, to go with another person. Um, and even if you have been up there before, it might be a good idea to make sure that you're going to meet somebody there. Uh, uh, there have been complaints about uh, camping, people who are camping at the park coming up and kind of harassing the, uh, the observers. Uh, a lot of lo problems with lights and traffic, et cetera. So um, one last thing, the RCA website has a few advisors under the heading observing on best practices. And I've given you a live link to that. 
please review them. Most importantly, uh, rule number one is please use a red flashlight. Okay, we are done right now, and I'm going to turn it back to Jim Todd. You're muted, Jim. Yep. And how's that sound? Much better. Okay. Might sound better if I'm muted. I don't know. Um, <laughs> all right. So welcome, everybody, to the Virtual Sky Report for July. Lots of happening. So a lot of happened in such a past month. The uh, last time we've had a meeting, talk about... Some of the things that happened last July, we were at Perihelion, Apihelion, and uh, there was a nice little photograph that came out uh, on astronomy picture of the day, where you, you could see the difference between Perihelion and Happy Apihelion. And so, what happened on July third is that uh, Apihelion, the sun is at its furthest distance, it's about roughly ninety four point five million miles, and then Paleohelion is out of closest in, Jan in January. So often when we have uh, kids in the planetarium, they think it's, uh, it's warm because the sun is closer. Okay? And so, yeah, I can see why would they would think that, especially uh, with the past month that we've had this heat wave thinking, wow, the sun is really close. Okay? So, um, not exactly. And then hopefully you guys got to see this wonderful gathering between Mars, Venus, and the moon. It was actually quite spectacular. I was able to see it from my uh, own backyard, and uh, it was pretty impressive. Mars was really faint, but uh, still it was really nice to look at. So hopefully you got to see that. And then... Richard Branson spent all his money, and let me see here. I got people trying to get in, and let me do this. There we go. Richard Branson and his crew, a few selected crew members from the Virgin Atlantic, on July 11th, which finally were able to go up on in the flight on the Unity 22 from, of all places, New Mexico. And so um, I watch it live, and um, you know, it, it, it was fun to watch. And that's a lot of money for four minutes, um, microgravity. And uh, so they got about roughly 50, 60 miles above and were able to see the curvature of the earth. And as uh, soon as they got uh, the uh, maximum height, they were able to get out of their seat and float. I don't know about you, but that looks like a lot of fun. I mean, I would be willing to do that. Okay, but four minutes is not enough to do all justice. Okay? But they were able to see the curvature of the earth and uh, they got to see the black and all of that. It's, that's pretty cool. I mean, give it, granted, it was. I mean, not, not exactly science, but um, it was a good, fun thing to watch in engineering. But if any of you are interested, go to their website, buy a ticket, you get yourself a ride up on the uh, from New Mexico, Virgin Atlantic, uh, Galactic. And so um, I applaud Richard. You know, he, he, this is uh, like what, the 75th attempt to, uh, to uh, defeat death, they say. Uh, but look at that. You look out the window. I mean, isn't that everybody's dream to be able to look out a window and see the curvature of the earth? I would be excited too. Right? But four minutes is not enough. But uh, that was actually just kind of fun to watch, right? And then, of course, we had that incredible heat wave, the Omega, uh, where we had a huge high pressure system uh, that formed kind of like a dome. And um, it was uh, pretty phenomenal. But uh, NASA had several satellites monitoring the Earth, uh, taking the temperature, and it's critical because we need to learn from this. We need to see the pattern. So all of that. So uh, NASA was very much involved. And then, of course, we're seeing a lot of smoke, just as Margaret mentioned about, uh, talking about Oregon Star Party and such. Um, there's about, I think, about 20 fires already going on in the state of Oregon alone. Um, so um, it's looking kind of scary. But uh, again, NOAA and NASA 
have satellites in orbit, but able to see these hotspots. And this is allowed the firefighters to get more data, per se, to go out and fight those fires. But that's the kind of a sad picture. Uh, could look at how many states the smoke is covering. And uh, we also should be feeling a little blessed having this uh, Pacific Marine air pushing that smoke away from Portland. But um, this could be a tough summer. Okay. Sorry. And then, uh, I don't know if many of you probably saw this, uh, Juno did a flyby of Ganymede. And uh, so this is a um, astro footage uh, from Juno making a close flyby of the largest moon in the solar system. It's pretty impressive. And so um, I'm hoping that this will come out for the planetarium. I could just see this on the planetarium dome. Uh, but it's a nice details, lot of data. And so um, people, whoop. and there's a lot of um, fun thing to look at just in this picture alone. You see that Academy doesn't have any atmosphere, lots of craters, you know, lots of details, but this is the fun part. You start backing away and then you realize how far Ganymede is from Jupiter. It's smaller and smaller. And then it does a flyby of Jupiter. And then at the Terminator, where day and night, uh, the um, uh, day and night section, you actually see the storm, you see the lightning storms in this. Right? So we zoom in. Now, it start is low, it's low in the frame. But if you look towards a little bit towards the left, look at that, you see the storms. Right? And so that it's pretty impressive. Right? And then it starts to fly over the surface of, of Jupiter, we get more and more details. Right? And so um, right away, just we're seeing some amazing stuff coming out from Juno. And um, this is uh, available on their website, I believe, on the NASA website too. Um, but to get closer and closer, it's hard to, it's, to me, looking at that, so that's Jupiter, that really Jupiter, right? Okay? And so you're looking at all those wonderful details uh, in the atmosphere of Jupiter. There are more to come. And then on July 16th, we had a, a fairly large Corona Mac digestion. And look at that down there in the lower left. That's a massive storm. So if anything to be said, cycle 25 is, is waking up for sure. And just yesterday, NASA finally was able to wake up the computer, 1990 computer, um, and used the backup system. Uh, the primary system seemed to be uh, the power supply uh, seemed to have a problem. So they used the backup and it's back up and running, which to me, to me I'm actually very delighted that uh, they were able to get this thing back and, and working again. So as I mentioned, the sunspots are really active right now. There are more and more sunspots starting to appear on the sun. So this is about roughly a week's worth. And you can see that there's a fair amount of sunspots that are starting to appear on the sun. So uh, we've had a few close calls with the um, corona mass digestion, still pretty moderate. And, but we're in the month of July, so we shouldn't be expecting that much opportunity for auroras yet. Right? And so when, last time I checked, uh, there wasn't much um, to uh, write home about. So looking ahead, um, tomorrow morning, um, it's gonna be Jeff turn, Jeff Bezos from uh, Amazon. So he and, and uh, three others are gonna go on board um, the uh, Blue Origin. One of them, I believe, is like an 18-year-old uh, kid. What a lucky kid. And Jeff and his brother, Mark, is going to go up. And then there's going to be uh, somebody that's uh, 82, 83 years old. It's going up in a flight. Again, just like Richard, it's going to go up and then come down. It's not actually going to go in orbit. Okay? But still, it's fun to watch. And that's the first um, human um, that's going to be going on board the uh, Blue Origin. And you can watch it at about six o'clock in the morning. 
uh, tomorrow morning, I believe it's probably going to be streamed. It seems like everything is being streamed these days. I'll talk about the planets. As I talked about Mars and Venus. Uh, Mars is about to set. Venus is going to be getting higher. And Jupiter and Saturn are really putting on a, a show already over in the east. Uh, so we have the full moon coming up on the 22nd of August. We've got one on July 23rd. And the, met, the object on the Monte de the Omega, which many of you I'm sure have, have seen it, the beautiful object, well in the south right now. I saw it just a couple of nights ago. Uh, looked pretty good. Um, there was a lot of brown um, in the viewing, but uh, due to smoke. So it's easy to find. Use uh, the teapot. Basically, go up, straight up from there, and you find M17. It's a wonderful object to look at. Uh, well worth it. International Space Station, definitely an evening object right now. You have until August 3rd. And uh, just a few nights ago, or actually in the last star party that I did for the winery, uh, we saw the Chinese Space Station, and that was fun. Right? And so you go to spotthestation.com. You can actually um, get the uh, sighting opportunities uh, for the International Space Station. And you go to heaven to Bob, get the Chinese Space Station. As far as the Omni Star Party for 2021, I posted in form to actually officially cancel. Um, as Margaret mentioned, uh, both Rooster Rock and Sub Stewart are experiencing uh, some real uh, shortages of staff. Um, they're really just feeling that um, this is not a good summer to do this. With all the fire danger, uh, they're overwhelmed, uh, really. And uh, Rooster has to deal with Multnomah Falls. Tub Stewart is changing their administration. So we officially decided to cancel uh, Omdi Star Party for this summer. And so there was some hope, but they just cannot muster the staff. And the first is, it's actually just starting. Um, it's a window of opportunity from July 17th to August 26th. It will peak on August 11th and 12th. And that night, it will be about 13% full. Not bad. Not bad. It's always a popular event. Uh, very popular for uh, star parties. And that's why we have a good number of Omdi star, uh, winery star parties the month of August, because they're hoping to see the Percy's. And so the first is a, it's a remnant from comic book Tuttle. And uh, so with a little bit of the moon, it shouldn't be too bad. So it's always fun to watch. Right? And then uh, August 1st, Saturn is going to be in uh, opposition. And though to be a new um, opposition means that the Earth is in between the planet that's uh, in opposition and the sun. Right? So, that's when the planet's at its closest. It's visible from sunset to sunrise all night long. It's definitely worth a look. So I just saw Saturn um, a couple of nights ago, and um, it looks really good. You can see the ring. And then a few nights later, August 19th, Jupiter will be in opposition. So in the month of August, we have two planets in opposition. It couldn't happen at a better time where we have multiple star parties and stuff occurring at that time. So lots of opportunities for some great photographs, the Percy's, uh, the opposition, and so on. So you want to get some pictures, send them out for the uh, RCA calendar of 2022. So with that, stay healthy, everybody, and um, go out and look at the nighttime sky. Okay, so... Now I'm back again, and this time I have a wonderful opportunity to uh, introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Um, Bevis, are you there? Where are you? There you are. Okay. And so uh, um, give you a little bit of background. Um, he studied uh, IT at the University of Detroit, specializing in programming, and earned a BS in computer science. He worked in the IT field for such an, an entities of, uh, of General Motors, Ed, Eddie Bauer, Pacific Core, and the state of Ohio. He lived in Michigan, Ohio, San Francisco, Seattle, and finally settled in Portland in 2012. And then he joined a family business operating UPS stores. 
He currently has two stores in Portland. Although he caught the cosmology bug, <laughs> cosmology, astronomy bug, um, in about 1988. And then after attending self-motivation program, he encountered with his encounter with astronomy did not begin in its earnest until 2016, when his wife, Rena, I think I hope I said that right, Rena, uh, gave him a membership to RCA. That's the best gift. Those are the best kind. He almost instantly purchased his first telescope, which is a 15 inch ultra compact obsession. Nice. Uh, and he been out on the observing field ever since, uh, getting a chance when uh, mm -hmm. he can. Uh, committed Dobsonian telescope user, Bevacy started down an inve investigative hole when some of his fellow observers began to think about reprinting an out of date book of the new general catalog, NGC object. So, those of you who are new, that's what it stands for NGC, it's the new general catalog. Like someone who starts to fix a door and end up building a house, Bevis went down a creative and collaborative path that led up to a result he wasn't expecting. <clears throat> a comprehensive field guide to the new general catalog is in the result. He's going to tell us how it came about. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a nice warm RCA welcome to Bevis. Thank you, Jim. So everybody can hear me? All yeah. right. Well, uh, Jim, thank you for uh, your kind introduction. Margaret uh, and Mark, I don't think Mark Martin is here, but I appreciate uh, you guys inviting me to speak. A uh, lot of familiar faces here, lots of friends that I haven't seen in a long time. And I was hoping to uh, get some of them uh, at OSP, but uh, I guess I'll have to wait a little longer. Um, but let's see, so when Mark asked me to uh, come and talk to the club, uh, I was uh, really excited, uh, you know, it was an opportunity to talk about my book, my work. But then I started thinking that, what is it that I really want to communicate here? What, 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 what are, why do I want to give this presentation? And uh, two things really jumped out at me. One was obviously talk about the book and how useful uh, and valuable it is uh, for amateur astronomers. But the second thing was, equally, if not more important than the book itself, was the story of how the book got created. And to me, that's it's a story of collaboration, cooperation, and, uh, and really a testament to what this club is. You know, RCA is an amazing resource. There is no way I could have created this book without RCA being uh, a resource to me. So, it, that was really more important aspect of my story that I wanted to tell is that how this book uh, uh, came to be. Um, as Jim said, I started observing uh, first in uh, 2017. So when the first draft of this book came out, I had been observing for a little over a year. So how does a newbie like me go about creating a book that some of the veterans have enjoyed and uh, you know appreciated and then I've gotten so much feedback. Uh, so that's, that's really an amazing uh, uh, accomplishment that, uh, that I was able to uh, achieve with the help of so many others in the club. Again, without the club, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the book uh, you know, would have, uh, would have come into existence. So uh, I got to share my uh, desktop here. Uh, let's see. What's the, what's the feature here? Uh, let's see. See the share screen down at the bottom. Ah, there you go. Yes, but he's literally sharing his desktop right now. There you go. All right. So a comprehensive field guide to the NGC. And I just spoke a little bit uh, to this slide why this presentation. So comprehensive field guide. What is it? Uh, 
this this is how my talk will go it's kind of a roadmap to to the talk today first i'm going to do an introduction uh, then i talk a little bit about myself uh, a lot of it's already been uh, said by jim and i said a couple of things already uh, then i'll speak a little bit about row city astronomers um, for for the long time members this is you know something nothing new that i'm going to say but i'm hoping that there are a lot of new members or recent members that uh, that can take away some uh, good information from this um, why did i create the guide uh, how did i go about creating it and why did i uh, get into making it available to the amateur astronomy community and finally how to use it so Pavesh? that's kind of the structure of my uh Pavesh, can you uh, yeah. there we go there you go okay so I got to move, uh, just a minute, give me a second here. Okay. All right. So here's a, there's a front picture of the four volumes, volume one, two. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yep. All right. So, uh, the, the first two volumes are autumn and winter and uh, uh, third and fourth volume are for summer and spring. Um, so first of all, what is NGC? Again, most of the uh, old timers, as Margaret like to say, that you guys are all familiar with what it is and uh, Jim uh, uh, touched on it a little bit. So NGC is a new general catalog of nebulae and clusters of stars. Uh, it's a catalog of deep, deep sky objects compiled by John Dreyer in eight, uh, 1888. Uh, it contains uh, 7,840 entries of galaxies, star clusters, and uh, uh, nebulae. Uh, and it's also an ambitious bucket list. Uh, a lot of folks I've talked to, you know, do uh, various observing programs like Messier program or uh, Caldwell program or uh, Herschel 400. Uh, NGC is kind of like the ultimate because it's got so many objects and spanning the <coughs> both Northern as well as uh, Southern hemisphere. So this particular guide is really a compilation of experience, knowledge, data, and images. So a lot of this uh, you know, factors came into play. Experience, obviously, I didn't have any, so I had to rely on a lot of uh, club members. Uh, knowledge, uh, you know, web has made uh, knowledge available uh, uh, very freely. Images were a little hard to find, and uh, some of the metadata was not so hard to find, but it wasn't easy to uh, pull out of the web. So that's that's what this uh, field guide uh, is made up of. Uh, it's a powerful aid to amateur astronomers in selecting and observing targets. One of the uh, one of the most difficult tasks is that when you are looking at a faint fuzzy galaxy and don't know whether you're really looking at your object or not, how, how do you really uh, verify? You know, you can bring in uh, some experienced observer and they have seen it and they can confirm it. Um, or find a different way to do it. So I'm hoping that this field guide would provide that method where if, even if you are by yourself, you can look at your eyepiece, the view in your eyepiece and look at the images and confirm that you are indeed looking at the object that you are uh, looking for. Uh, and it's, uh, again, as I said earlier, this is an example of what's possible with cooperation and collaboration. Um, that's what we are all about. Um, so this content of the book is large size black and white images of 7,000 plus objects. Uh, some of the other aspects I already talked to. Um, oh, I went by a little too fast there. So this are some of the features of the, of the field guide. And uh, just want to talk a little bit about myself. And uh, this is in the context of knowing a little bit about myself is kind of a 
uh, a story as to how I was able to put these books together, what, you know, what different uh, aspects of my past uh, and my experiences uh, helped me put this book together. So first I was a trained as software engineer. I did programming. Uh, then I was uh, I've also practiced uh, some folk art of India, uh, Native American art. Hopefully that gave me some insight into aesthetics. Um, I also operated a small shipping business and printing business. So that gave me some insight into how to set up books and print them. Um, uh, I've always been fascinated by, uh, uh, by the stars, uh, uh, the skies, and uh, I am uh, really a lot of my friends and members would, uh, would, would say that I'm not ashamed to ask questions. Uh, no question for me is too silly. If I have a question, I'll ask it, and that's how I, I think I have picked up so much information from so many uh, people before me. And, and then finally, the last ingredients, it's really the Rose City Astronomers. Um, here is a little bit of information. Looks like, uh, Margaret, I have a little bit uh, old numbers, 600 members. Uh, I guess that was from earlier on. So as you know, we are 700 plus now and growing stronger. Um, so it, it's just amazing that, uh, again, I'm addressing to any new members who are here in the meeting, uh, we have a, the, the club has a telescope library. I mean, that's just amazing. Uh, unfortunately, I think the library is not uh, operating right now because of COVID, but hoping that it will open up soon and uh, please go out. There are so many wonderful telescopes. Uh, uh, go out and borrow them. You can borrow them for a month. Uh, and that's really how, uh, you know, I, I got, uh, uh, got exposed. To, uh, to observing uh, and many, many amazing uh, club members. And I really truly believe that if I have seen further or deeper into the skies, it's been by standing on the shoulders of these giants. Uh, my observing experience, uh, again, has been mentioned since 2016. So I'm a very novice observer. Um, so why did I create this field guide? What, what started all this? So a little while ago, <clears throat> it started with these two guys. Oh, sorry, I got wrong images, guys. It was really these two guys. So these are my uh, observing buddies. On the left is uh, Steve uh, Weiler. And on the right, standing on the table is uh, Dave Kasnick. Um, Steve and Dave, I think, go a long time back. They, were, they used to be uh, college roommates and they got on their path and then uh, got together, I think, at one of the OSPs. And they've been, uh, they had been observing together when I showed up uh, on the scene. And uh, Dave had a, a book of NGC pictures and uh, he used it quite frequently to refer to it while observing. And there was one copy, it was all tattered and not quite good. And Steve kept uh, you know, uh, asking that, hey, uh, can I get a second copy somewhere? Unfortunately, where Dave got it from, uh, that source did not have any more copies. So fast forward to April, 2018, and one of the star parties organized by RCA at Maupin, um, I was uh, sharing a book that I had printed. If uh, a lot of you may be familiar with Alvin Huey's uh, Faint Fuzzies and uh, Galaxy Groupings book, and I had downloaded and printed that. So I was sharing that with David, and uh, if something occurred, and David said, hey, you think you can print a better copy of this book? I said, sure, I, I got a printer, and uh, I got binding equipment. Sure, why not? Let's, uh, let's find the images. Uh, clean them up and uh, reprint the book. So this was the book uh, David had. It was an NGC pictorial field guide by Daryl West. Uh, Daryl lives in uh, and works in Olympia and the book was laminated and it had 30 pages, uh, 30 images per, 
per page and each image was one inch by one inch, very grainy. Uh, it was a white object on black background, but it was the best that was available. Um, so I said, well, uh, and this is what it kind of looked like, the inside of the book, and I've kind of blown up three objects. Um, I got hold of Mr. West and asked him if I could uh, use the images that he had downloaded. He was happy to do that, except he said uh, all those images were about 100 plus CDs, and he couldn't find those CDs anymore. So what, what else is out there? I said, if, if he doesn't have it, I, that cannot be the only source. There's got to be other places where I can find high resolution uh, electronic images uh, of all the NGC objects. So, you know, there are anybody who has been to again to RCS library or been to any star, uh, star parties has seen some of these, uh, you know, publications that uh, a lot of amateurs, amateur astronomers uh, carry with them. So I started with that. Uh, Pocket Atlas, it's great, but there are no images in there. Uh, Messier Marathon has got uh, charts and images, but really doesn't have, it's a very limited scope. It's only 110 images or objects. Night Sky Observer Sky, now that's a good uh, publication. It's got very thorough, lot of information, pictures, finder charts, but it spans over three pretty heavy, thick volumes and really can't take it out in the field because if you have uh, due conditions, uh, the books will be uh, damaged. Uh, turn left to Orion, again, it had limited scope. Uh, and then Interstellar, uh, that was pretty close to what I was looking for, but still not quite enough. So having gone through all these books, I, I wasn't uh, satisfied that these are the books I was looking for. So what to do now? Um, I, I couldn't find anything ready-made, so should I give up or make one up myself? And that's the path uh, I decided to take is, uh, I'm gonna move this for a minute here. So where else can I find all the NGC images uh, in high resolution? Uh, what else is out there? So I started now, I started searching various websites, uh, went to various sites uh, maintained by NASA, STSI, Vizier, Sinbad, lot, NED, lots of places. And uh, uh, late 2018, I came up on a website called the NGC IC Project. And that site had everything I was looking for. So I got to work on it and put on my programmer hat, wrote some scripts and uh, downloaded uh, uh, tons and tons of images. And at the same time also wanted to make sure I had the permission from, uh, from the owners of that website. So I sent, there were four or five people, I sent them email saying, can I please use your images in the publication I want to, uh, I want to print. Uh, and again, remember this, at this point, this is just a book that I'm creating for me and Steve and Dave and maybe a couple of other friends. There was no plan of this being uh, made available to the wider community. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I started making a proof of concept that what this would look like. Um, so I also wanted to see what, what is it that I wanted to get into this book uh, until now, it was just, you know, reproduce Daryl's images. But now if I'm finding uh, additional images, what else do I want to do? Um, there was a lot of information as, as I went through all these different websites. I found a lot of other useful information that I thought would be nice to have included with, uh, with, with the field guide. So I started uh, making a wish list. So, well, I got to have all the NGC objects. Large images because <clears throat> the previous book had very small and grainy and uh, you know black uh, background with white images. I wanted to see black objects in the white background. So at night you can, uh, you can see it easily under the red light. 
uh, and I was just starting to learn star hopping, and but that was at a much larger level. Uh, so I figured that there should be a way to do that for uh, for deep sky objects too. That once you are in a field of view, uh, wouldn't it be nice to have a local uh, field of uh, stars that we can use as a reference and identify the objects we're looking for? And some useful metadata as to what the object is, how bright it is, how far it is, etc. So, and also wanted to make sure it was light and easy uh, that I can carry in the field. So that's where uh, kind of wishly started uh, coming together. Uh, so this is uh, this is an image of the first proof of concept in March 2019, and initially there were five books. And they were just basically listed alphabetically from uh, Andromeda to Virgo and everything in between was listed uh, alphabetically. And within uh, each book, within each constellation, NGC objects were listed numerically. Um, so I showed this book uh, to Dave and Steve at that mopping star party in March 19. They liked it and said, keep going at it. Um, and at this point, I'm still waiting to hear back from the NGCIC project owners, uh, hoping that they would allow me to use their images. This is what that book looked like. There were eight images and I had turned their images upside down uh, to, uh, to match the view in a Dobsonian. So while I'm doing this research, uh, I encountered a couple of roadblocks. One was I realized that there are almost 300 plus images missing from NGCIC projects database. So, and, uh, and, and then in spring 2019, not only I didn't get any response from the, the people who maintain the site, but suddenly the site was taken down and I was getting the 404 message. So no, no response, um, but I continued my uh, research and I encountered a website called Revised NGCIC Data. This was maintained by Dr. Wolfgang Steinicke in Germany. Uh, I came upon his site again by looking at many other websites. And one thing I saw was that all of those websites were referring to Wolfgang Steinicke's website and his data. So to me, it seemed like that he had done something that was uh, widely accepted as, uh, you know, as a uh, uh, fairly good information. So I went to, to his website and uh, also contacted Dr. Steinicke, uh, had some conversations with him, uh, and he, uh, he gave me his permission to use his metadata for the book that I was using. Uh, this was July 19. And at some point he had said he was going to come and visit Portland in uh, March or April of 2020. <laughs> that did not happen. So I'm still waiting for him to uh, show up one of these days. And maybe uh, Margaret, when he comes in, maybe we can invite him uh, as a guest speaker uh, for the meeting. So one thing I learned in addition to finding a good, uh, good database was where did all these images come from? The original project whose website was down, uh, they had used these images from a project or, a, or an initiative called the DSS. It was a digitized sky survey images. So the relief was that although that website was taken down, I now had access to the original images that they used. So now I got to go one level deeper into ownership and uh, find out where I can find these images. Um, again, uh, I wasn't aware of too many sources and uh, there again, RCA member, Dr. Stefano Meschiari, um, somehow I got connected with him. I think he responded to one of my uh, notes in the forum. I met with him and uh, he pointed me to an archive database where, which contained all the DSS images. And this is where I hit the mother load. 
I found everything that I was looking for. Um, so Digitize Sky Survey is, is really an international collaboration started in the probably 80s and 90s. And that was, uh, there was a sky, sky, all sky survey. Uh, and it was created to support the Hubble telescopes observing program. And their website says also as a service to astronomical community. Um, there were two main telescopes used for the survey. <clears throat> the Southern Hemisphere surveys were using UK's uh, Schmidt telescope. And those images are now copyrighted by Anglo-Australian Observatory. And the Northern Hemisphere surveys uh, were conducted by the Palomar Observatory and uh, Caltech currently holds the copyright to those images. So at this moment, I just want to take a moment and thank both the Anglo-Australian Observatory and the Caltech, because they were very generous with their permission to let me use uh, this 7,000 images. <clears throat> so while I'm working on downloading these images, Dr. Sainiki uh, mentions to me that there is another resource just like what I'm trying to create. And you can see the picture of it. It's called NGCIC Photographic Catalog. And it was created by, uh, authored by two uh, authors in Japan, Numazawa and Makia. Um, they used Dr. Steinick's data, which made me feel comfortable that good, uh, this data is valid and has some uh, credibility. And they use the same DSS images. So at this point, I'm saying, well, if there's a book out there, then I don't need to create one. I'll just go buy it. Um, I look for the book on the web and this is what it looked like. So this is, this is a little bit bigger than eight and a half by 11 paper. And there are 20 images and there are also white object on black background. So uh, the book was beautiful. It was hardcover and it was, I believe it has, it had NGC as well as IC objects. So it's very, very bulky volume. Not, it's not a book that you want to take out in the field. Uh, the paper was not waterproof and it was more ideal for when you're sitting at home, planning your observing sessions or just doing research. Uh, still not a good uh, product for field use. So, I believe this was, uh, I, I felt that this was the last straw. Now I got to make this book that I started out to uh, uh, you know, create from David's book. So now I said, well, I have a little bit more information than I had before. And so I'm st starting to add more things to my wish list. Uh, waterproof paper, reference tables, I also wanted to put in uh, cross references between uh, various uh, observing programs like Messier, uh, Herschel 400, Caldwell. Um, also wanted to include SkyZone. This is a target planning tool developed by Dave Kasnick. Uh, so there, those additional features that I felt that would be good to have in the book. So the organization of the book, uh, from late 2019 to spring 2020, just when the COVID hit, um, Dave and Steve and I uh, exchanged many emails. Uh, we went back and forth on what to include, what not to include, um, what should be the field of view because I can zoom in, I can download images uh, zoomed in so that the entire image fill the, the square or I can zoom out and what's the right field of view, how many minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 10 minutes. So we went through several algorithm and, uh, uh, and figured out what would be a decent uh, field of view based on the size of the object. And at this point, I decided that we'll do, uh, we'll, we'll divide the volumes into by, by, uh, uh, by season, one, two for spring, summer, and two for autumn, winter. And I wanted each volume to be self-contained. So there is a section in the front that's a reference section. So it's got all the reference tables, uh, indexes, uh, and they're repeated throughout all four books. 
so while I was making this book, a lot of people asked me that, why are you creating a paper book? Isn't that kind of, uh, you know, uh, anachronistic? Uh, you know, everything is going electronic. And my response was, yeah, I come from IT background. I, I'm a consumer of electronics. But this is a, a media that is really suitable for, for what we do. Um, you know, the benefit is that the, one, I'm using waterproof paper. Uh, you don't need any power. There is no light trespass. You don't need internet connection. And most important, when you open up the book, um, you can see 24 objects. And you, you can see the perspective that once you find one object, you can kind of traverse the neighborhood and hit other objects uh, in, in the same neighborhood. Uh, so now this is where transition happened from, it's just being a book bit for, for three or four of us to let's make it available to the community at large. Um, so Dave and Steve and other uh, club members that I shared with, they encouraged me to uh, you know, go out and go public with this. And uh, they, they really were very supportive and said, yeah, this is something that they can see using. Uh, if it was available in the market, they can uh, see, uh, you know, getting one for themselves. Uh, you know, again, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the talk, they're easy to uh, select targets, reference stars, uh, and uh, traversing the neighborhood uh, to see, uh, you know, adjoining uh, objects, and it it really makes uh, observing efficient, so you can make the most of your limited time that we get, especially in summers, when the dark sky, uh, dark dark night is uh, time is very limited. What's in the book? So each book contains seven thousand forty seven images. And the entire volume is printed on 685 pages. Uh, it's got table of contents, tables, cross-references, sky zone chart, map, and a full NGC index. So here is an image of the four books covers. Uh, you saw this earlier. Uh, these images were, uh, I wanted to uh, you know, honor Hubble telescope. So these are images taken by Hubble. Uh, and available, again, this is our tax dollars at work. So they're available for anyone uh, to download uh, for uh, any purpose. Uh, so it's a beautiful, uh, and uh, earlier as Todd mentioned, you know, Hubble is back again, and that's an amazing, uh, amazing news to have it, uh, uh, have it around for a little longer. So this is what the book looks like when it's opened up. Uh, it's spiral bound so you can uh, fold it in half or keep it open this way to to see larger uh, much larger picture so i want to get a little bit into details uh, of what and what each image uh, uh, what what the uh, object of an each uh, data is uh, displayed with uh, each object so one you see the ngc number what constellation it's in, uh, some information about the object that's a galaxy and what's the classification, it's a spiral bar, uh, what's its magnitude, surface brightness, and how far it is. Here is its location in RA and declination, some other names and common names. Uh, although this section is blank for a lot of the objects, but it does come in handy once in a while when you have common names for uh, uh, deep sky objects. Um, these two pieces of information are really important. Uh, the one on the left that says 17 by 17, that is the size in minutes, uh, angular minutes of this image. So this image is 17 minutes by 17 minutes. And the uh, object itself is 11.2 minutes by 6.9 minutes. So having these two pieces of information kind of helps you Locate it within your IPs field of view. So if I have a 13 millimeter and I'm using it on my telescope, I have a field of view about 33 minutes. So this tells me 
how this object would fit in once it's in the center. <clears throat> Um, so what objects are included is, uh, as most people know or are familiar with NGC, that there are 7,840 objects. Uh, now, as I learned, it's not really 7,840 objects, it's 7,840 entries. It's because some of the objects have multiple entries, uh, like if it has a nebulae, large nebulae or a galaxy, uh, you may have multiple entries for that object saying the Eastern part of the galaxy, Western part. So really it's one object, but it has multiple entries. Uh, there are also uh, duplicate entries. As you know, this catalog was initially put together in 1888. So there are some errors and there are some duplicates. So there are about 260 entries that have duplicate entries. Um, and I also decided not to include 405 stars. So when I was done selecting what I wanted to uh, show in the book, it was 7,047 images, objects. Uh, 6,000 plus are galaxies, um, nebulae 147 plus 94, and open clusters and globular clusters. So this is really the content uh, of the books. Uh, Again, benefits of using the field guide. I wanted to show you in a, uh, and demonstrate as to how this uh, plays out. So for example, if I was looking at NGC 3251 or 3338, um, I can tell that uh, 3251 is a 13.4th magnitude galaxy and uh, 3338 is 11.1. Um, depending on your scope, if you have a 10 inch or 12 inch aperture, this 13.4 would be a very difficult object to see. And even 11.1 uh, magnitude object might be difficult to see. So wouldn't it be nice to use the stars that are in the surrounding area as, uh, as like mini asterisms. So when you look at that, uh, I kind of imagine there is a lines joining here and if this is what I see in my field of view and I locate the central object, now I know I'm looking at the object uh, 3251. Same thing with 3338. If you look at it, there's kind of a diamond shaped cluster of stars. So if I look at those, I can see right next to is, uh, is my uh, target. Um, this was a very nice object I saw a couple of months ago. Uh, 2894, although the galaxy itself is a pretty decent 12.4 magnitude, uh, the size is very small. It's almost two minutes by one minute. If you were to look at this in your eyepiece, you would see a string of stars like this, and the galaxy would kind of hide behind the stars, and you might not be able to tell that you're looking at a galaxy. It just looks like bright stars. But because I had this image and I could tell that this is, I, I can see this uh, uh, shape in my eyepiece and then I can zero in on this area and I can really resolve the galaxy as, as a galaxy and not as a star. Um, again, uh, another, ob uh, another benefit was to be able to see where, where your object is and what's around it and kind of hit the objects in quick succession without moving too far or moving too much. Um, for example, if I was looking at Andromeda and this was the page open on my desk and my table, uh, and let's say I wanted to, of all these images, uh, all these objects, uh, NGC 68 is one of the brightest ones and it's 12.9 magnitude. So it would be easy to capture in my eyepiece. So, I, uh, you know, I center my eyepiece to 68 and I confirm it using these other objects around it. Once I do that, now I'm looking around and I can see there are a lot of neighboring objects that I can see. So it starts with 68, that's my object. And if I look at this little dot, that's pointing me to NGC 67. This one is pointing me to 71. Here is 69. 
And from 69, I can jump to 72. From 69, I can jump to 70. And from 72, I can jump to 74. So within a, a span of maybe five to 10 minutes, I was able to hit seven targets. Uh, so this is really an advantage that's available by, by using uh, this kind of layout. Um, <clears throat> this was another example. Uh, I, I personally did this observation, uh, looked at 4565. It's a pretty big size objects. Uh, you know, field of view is 24 minutes and magnitude is 9.6. So, you know, even eight or 10 inch telescope can uh, resolve it in their eyepiece. So once I was done, I was able to identify, again, didn't need much identification, but just for the heck, I could see these two stars and these three stars kind of making a, making a shape there. And as I was uh, moving away from it, I noticed this fuzzy object on the upper left corner. And I said, what is that? Uh, and I could see that in my, uh, in my eyepiece. So I zoomed back out and looked at the page. Here is the 4565 that I was looking at. And when I looked around, this object seemed like what I was looking at, but how do I confirm that? So I looked at that object. Well, that's a 13.4 magnitude galaxy. And how do I verify that this is what I'm looking at? So I go back and I look at these two stars and yep, they're right here. And then there is this star right here that was next to it. So using this method, I was looking for a 9.6 galaxy and I was able to find a 13.4 magnitude galaxy. If I didn't have this, I probably easily would have missed this object. So here is the 4562. So this is uh, really all the, all the examples I wanted to show you. Now going back to the original book that uh, Dave had, uh, from Daryl West, the one inch uh, images. So these were the three objects I had uh, identified earlier in the, in the presentation, 253, 224, and 891. So we started with this, and this is what we got to. I would say the mission's accomplished. So these are some other uh, spreads. This is Virgo, you can see a couple of uh, galaxies next to each other. Uh, here's some more images from uh, Scorpius. Uh, this one shows, obviously, because Scorpio, you'll see a lot of clusters and nebulae. And uh, so that, those are all the images information. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are other useful tools also in the book. Um, I put in a lot of uh, data. This was like the uh, the data geek in me. I wanted to know how many objects in what uh, constellation. So this table will show you the constellation and how many galaxies are there, how many clusters are there, how many nebulae are there. Um, I always struggled with pronouncing uh, the, uh, the, the, the constellation names. So I found uh, a resource where you have the actual name of the constellation, its pronunciation and its genitive pronunciation, Antilli, uh, Apodis. Uh, so this was, this was a kind of a cool feature I thought would be nice to have. And with each uh, um, constellation, it also shows how many total objects are in that constellation in NGC. And the, the square degrees area of the sky included, uh, covered by that constellation. Uh, some of the constellations are marked with an asterisk, and that is uh, indicating constellations uh, which are circumpolar. So you can see them year round. Now comes all the cross references. So Messier cross reference with NGC. There are two versions of it. One just listing NGC, uh, sorry, Messier number one through, one through 110 and then dividing it by uh, constellation. Uh, Herschel 400 in the same way. Uh, there's a little bit more uh, uh, division there. 
uh, it's by constellation and by summer winter um, uh, division. So it's easy to identify because there are a lot more objects in Herschel than in Messiae. Uh, ARP, this, these are some interesting galaxies, interacting galaxies, merging galaxies. So here is a, a cross reference uh, with, with that program. Uh, Caldwell objects. And here are the duplicate entries. And this was kind of discovered when Steve was looking at, I don't remember what it was, but he said, hey, Babesh, we're looking for 3630. There's a bug in your book. We can't find 3630. Uh, so when I dug in a little bit more, I found out that well, 3630 is a duplicate number. And that object is really listed under 3645. So that was a nice, uh, nice little find. Uh, and then every book has, I believe, 18 or 19 pages of uh, full index. So you can look at an NGC number, NGC 160 is in book one, page number four. So it's easy to, easy to locate your objects. Uh, one more easy reference was the full night sky constellations. And with each constellation, um, I did two things. Uh, if it's in italics, uh, it's um, autumn, winter constellation. If it's non-italic, it's spring, summer. And right next to each constellation, uh, it shows you what book and what page. So Scorpius is in book four, page 67. And uh, here's uh, also a really very, very powerful tool. This is a tool that Dave Kasnick developed uh, a while ago. It's, uh, it's called Sky Zones and uh, it's a little bit complicated. So if you get a chance, download this from, from my website and kind of look at it. Uh, it'll, it'll take a minute to get used to it. But the table, the way it works is you start with the day you're observing. So let's say in this example I'm gonna give, it's April 20th. This is my observing date. So he has divided the entire sky into the zones, A1, A2, B1, B2, and B3, with west being here and north here. So idea was that A1 is really southern, southern uh, horizon objects. And on a given night, you want to hit them first because they're gonna be gone very fast. A2 is still looking south, but from 20 degrees to 50 degrees. Um, look at those next. Then V1, these are the objects on the Western skies. Get to them next because they're gonna be setting soon. V2 is overhead and V3 is, uh, is a constellations, are the constellations that are just about to rise. So B3 will have some time over the night. So if you want to really efficiently use your time, start this way, A1, A2, B1, B2, and B3. So the way it works is you select your uh, date. Uh, so here are the dates, January through December, and just find the date that's closest to your observing date. So April 20th is closest to April 15th. So I take this column, and these are the hours. Uh, I'm at 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, Zone A1 will have Antilla, A2 will have Corvus, Crater, uh, I believe this Hydra, and B1, B2, B3. This, uh, this chart is really uh, useful if you sit down during the day and plan out your objects uh, list. That will tell you that what time of the night, uh, which constellations are going to be in B2 this, this is where, this is the sweet spot where you want to get your objects. So that's, uh, uh, that's all the information there. Uh, I've had some uh, feedback from uh, people who have uh, got my books. Um, one of my favorite is the last one here. It's uh, Eric is a physics teacher at school in Dublin, New Hampshire. And he told me that it's that he's using these books daily in the classroom and students are learning from it, which was really uh, very, very uh, happy to hear that. Um, and uh, I wanted to 
uh, you know, sh shout out to a lot of my friends, uh, mentors and um, educators in the club. And uh, without this uh, folks, I would not have been able to accomplish what I have done. Um, and I really thank them for their contribution. Again, if you are a new member in the club, uh, these guys are available or just pick anyone who is willing to help, which is pretty much everybody. And that uh, kind of concludes uh, my portion of the talk. And I uh, wanted to see if uh, anyone has any questions. Yeah, and thank you, Bevis. Give thank up you. a hand, everybody. Really incredible work. Thank uh, you. And so, folks, if you have questions, if you could please put it in chat. And I'll read it off to Bevis, and then we'll um, read it off. And I'll go start from there. So um, I remember Bevich came to me at one point and he showed me the list and uh, I knew that he was on something really early. And so this is great work. Okay. Um, uh, Emily says, hi, thanks for talking about this. Did you say this book was available for download? If so, where and how? Uh, unfortunately, it's not available for download. The only uh, medium that you can get this is in a, in the paper uh, paper form. Okay. And have you given it, uh, Gary? Uh, have you given any thought to the design of an optimum field side desk, a field side desk, so you can keep pages from your star guide in convenient proximity to a telescope eyepiece? Does it vary by telescope type and scale? Uh, I did think about making uh, various uh, uh, field of views, but what, what I came to conclusion, again, others also helped me uh, understand this better, is that a lot of these objects are 12, 13, 14, 15 magnitude, and you will need some aperture for that. Um, and with aperture, also what I've seen in the field is that people have, uh, you know, observing tables, and that's where they like to keep their reference material and keep everything away from the from the telescope. Again, if you had a book closer to the scope, you know, you're looking at the light, and uh, it it didn't seem uh, practical to have something close to your uh, that close to your uh, telescope. Mark says, uh, I had to question, what is the orientation of the field? Upside down, turned right side up and dob when things pass in the meridian. Yeah, so for most part, you have north, north down and south up. Um, but we have observed, depending on the time of the day, the images may be um, rotated slightly, but you can easily identify that once you look in the eyepiece. Uh, I, I've seen some constellation and I'm thinking that it's maybe because I was looking at it as they were rising on the east and that's why they were at a different angle. And the telescopes may have uh, taken the survey looking south. Um, and so orientation may be different based on that. But I, I don't have a good answer for that if there is, there is a, there's a way to tell. But, but if you're looking at the eyepiece, I, I think you will figure out um, what your object is. Jeff asked, can you estimate how many hours you put into this project? Nice job. <laughs> uh, no idea. <clears throat> this was uh, a lot of the work got done during uh, COVID. Uh, and I do remember uh, being up till two or three in the morning, many, many nights, working on this, tweaking it, just fine tuning it. No idea how many hours I spent. It's a labor of love. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's just an empire that matters, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, how did we order the book? Two volumes, right? Uh, so people can get either two volumes per, uh, uh, per season, like autumn and... Uh, uh, winter is volume one and two, and summer, spring is three and four. 
And again, you can go to my website, PDX, pdxastronomy.com. That's listed on the screen there. And all the information is uh, listed there. So you're going to retire now, Bevish? <laughs> I'm trying. You know, uh, Margaret asked, uh, what are you going to do next? <laughs> go to the Disneyland. No. <laughs> well, um, so this is a kind of a cautionary tale. So if somebody is thinking about getting this book, uh, I'll caution you. Uh, you are going to want a bigger aperture than what you have. So I started with a 15 inch uh, telescope, which is pretty big. But as I started going through different uh, objects, I started finding that even 15 inch was not enough. So Steve, and again, Steve and Dave, uh, we are working on creating a 24 inch, uh, uh, 2.75. Uh, <laughs> Cause I didn't want to uh, get up on a ladder so uh, I had Mr. Weiler design a beautiful uh, uh, telescope. We we're hoping to go live with it, first light uh, at OSP, but uh, now we'll see uh, what happens next. But uh, that, that device is almost ready and uh, it'll be out there in a few weeks. Gary, uh, are you planning to publish the metadata in the book into a digital form? Well, that data is actually available from Dr. Wolfgang uh, uh, Steinig's website. And again, if you go to my website, there is a link to his website and you can download everything that I have and actually in a big spreadsheet. And that contains uh, NGC as well as IC data. Um, and then, okay, Mike, uh, <laughs> what are you going to name your new ultra fast job? <laughs> uh, not yet. I got some, uh, some ideas in my head, but, uh, I haven't settled on a name yet. You know, uh, Bevish, uh, one of the things that's missing in the planetarium, yeah. a database is exactly a new general catalog. I would love to tap in with you and see if we can yeah. add the database to the planetarium. What a great resource that would be. Yeah. Uh, that is a, a big hang up in the planetarium industry as far as database. Mm. And uh, having the image, you can actually click on and the image comes out. Right. And then what have you, but we'll put our head together maybe later. Yeah, definitely. I'd be happy to work with you on that. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, Margaret, uh, do you have a picture of your new dom? Uh, I do, but it's not uh, handy here. It's all on my phone. Is your wife into this as well, Bevis? Is she into any of this part of this project, or is she just leaving you in your room and take care of the rest? Not yet. <laughs> One of these days. One of these days, yeah. This is great. Thank you. Okay, any more question? Oh, okay. you, we know that uh, Vev is gonna be around. We're gonna see him again and again. And so uh, this is a, another example with the diversity of talent that we have in this organization. It's just phenomenal. And I'm sure that many other organizations envy uh, Rosie the Astronomers for having such talent that we have in the club. And so uh, bravo Bevis, um, for your hard work on this, really a good job. Yeah. And thank you to everyone who has uh, contributed to uh, making the book. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I guess we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up because I don't see any more questions. Um, but uh, thank you again, Bevich. And uh, I'm sure that we're gonna see this book and many of the star parties and well-deserved um, exposure, really. Uh, so I'm just gonna see it. It's gonna cover the globe before you know it. And then Bevich can be tired. You know, <laughs> he, he, he doesn't have to uh, go to work anymore. Maybe. Soon enough. Thank you. 
Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, stay safe. We'll see you uh, for the month of August. It's going to be a busy month of star party, so go out there and look at the night sky. All right. Good night. Good night. Take care, Allison. Good night, Jim. Great meeting as always. Well, um, we might be in New Mexico this Christmas, but that all that all depends on you know, never know what the you know the situation is gonna be around then. So I would definitely look you, okay. Definitely. And I'll get you an invite to the observing site. Well, that 